Welcome to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast, where you get unconventional insights into wealth building and retirement that actually work. Discover data-driven strategies and learn from a wealth of experience so that you can take your retirement to the next level. Now, here's your host. He was once bitten by a harbor seal. The income engineer, Craig Strom. Excellent. Glad to be back with you here on Personal Pension Radio. Joined on the phone, sitting by the fire, Mr. Jeff Smith. Say hello, Jeff. Hi, Craig. Thanks for having me. We, uh, Jeff and I were joking before we got on the air here that uh, Jeff is uh, actually broadcasting for uh, with us uh, uh, remotely uh, from his home, uh, back uh, sitting next to the fire, roasting chestnuts, wearing a velour robe, and reading Christmas carols, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you you are here on Personal Pension Radio. We are broadcasting live from Mr. Foley's van. Actually, today in a, the paddock at Gasoline Alley at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, one of Jeff's favorite places. Uh, so absolutely, yeah, we're keeping things moving around the uh, the country here just to make sure that we're on the road all the time. Those of you who are new to Personal Pension Radio, uh, what's it all about? Uh, well. Optimizing retirement income, optimizing your retirement income is the key, but it does not happen with a product. It doesn't happen with a mutual fund. It doesn't happen with life insurance. It doesn't happen with real estate or any one particular thing. None of these things by themselves optimize your retirement income. You have to have an integrated approach. And what we're all about here at Personal Pension Radio is giving you the information and the conversation you need to make sensible decisions, to know who to talk to, to make sure that you can actually live the lifestyle that you really want someday in retirement and pass on a legacy if you choose. So a quick disclaimer, just a short little disclaimer that I I always like to give. I am not an attorney. I'm not a CPA. I don't play one on TV. The reason I share this is you really shouldn't act on advice that you hear from a podcast, a radio interview, a television interview, a newspaper article, uh, or from a financial entertainer that you might listen to, you really shouldn't act on that advice unless you've actually met with a qualified financial advisor to sit down and review your specific situation. So just keep that in mind uh, as you go through this. If you get some great information here, the first step I would suggest is get on to Personal Pension Radio and reach out and connect with me. I'd be happy to talk to you. So let's get back to Jeff. Jeff is the Vice President of Agency Sales and Development at One America and a car racing fanatic and a biker dude. How's that for an introduction, Jeff? Yeah, I love that. <laughs> so I cover- Usually when you say biker dude, people think I'm wearing, I, I drive a Harley, but I actually drive a Honda Goldwing. Oh, well, hey, so- you're a biker dude. You put on more miles than most yeah. Harley people have in their lifetime on on your uh, okay. on your bike. So that's the, that's the difference between Jeff and the average weekend biker dude is that Jeff actually rides long distances. I think you did one recently, right? Yeah, we were just down in North Carolina, put about 1,500 miles on the bike up in the Blue Ridge Parkway. Oh, that had to be a beautiful trip. It was gorgeous, yeah. No, fantastic. Well, I'll tell you what. I want to actually start to, just to kind of give everybody some background on how Jeff and I met. And, and Jeff is, uh, to say the least, and he hasn't paid me to say this, by the way, Jeff is just a dynamic guy. I mean, really fantastic guy to be with as a friend, but dynamic in the business, in, the, in this world that I live in, in the financial world. But his passion is just sometimes um, hard to control, right, Jeff? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I love what I do. That's outstanding. So maybe you could uh, start by just kind of giving us a little background because you did not always used to reside in the home office or the ivory tower, if you will. How in the world did you get uh, started in this business and then pulled back into or pulled into the, the home office? How did they drag you into that? Well, I started, uh, I actually just celebrated my 31st year in the financial services industry. And I started out uh, as a young, young person. Um, I spent some time in the military and got out of the military and uh, came into the financial services industry. And then I moved into management. I had my own um, financial services firm for about 22 years, I guess. And uh, 
seven and a half years ago, almost eight years ago now, I came into the uh, One America Home Office to help um, work with uh, financial advisors and uh, professionals across the country. Uh, I had a nice going firm in Madison, Wisconsin, and we lived there for 17 years. And But I was looking to do something different and uh, I've been doing economics-based planning for quite a while and just had the opportunity to, to change and move to the home office with One America. My son lives in Nashville, Tennessee, where he's a firefighter. My daughter still lives in Madison, Wisconsin. So Indianapolis was halfway in between uh, both of my kids and um, gave me an opportunity to, to work with people like you and others across the country and work with clients all over the country. So I'm really enjoying this time in my career uh, in doing retirement income planning. No, that's great. And it really has been, I have to say, just for everyone here listening, and, and by the way, once again, thank you to everybody listening across the country and even around the world. Uh, we've just been blessed with just a great audience, a lot of awesome feedback, and and I have been blessed to having met Jeff because his passion for this topic is contagious. It's absolutely contagious. Uh, so, before I move on, I had a question that actually you just caused me to write down. Um, I want to ask you for a favorite uh, motivational quote or two, because you've always got some good ones. And I just wanted to, wanted to hear what you had uh, as it relates to a motivational quote for the audience. Well, I think one of the things that um, one of the quotes I like to give to clients is to retirement income and is that we get one whack at. What that means is now, that... Just for, um, just for everybody, let me make sure to, to clarify, because your phone kind of cut out a little bit um, okay. right there in the great Wooly Wild West or Midwest where you're at. And you said, if you were going to find out... Now, wait a minute. You did the... Uh, if you, uh, the whack at the cat. If mm-hmm. you only had one whack at the cat, only have one whack at the cat, what do you mean by that? Well, as it relates to retirement income planning, when we've spent... Um, 30, 35 years at accumulating money, uh, when we get ready to retire, uh, we have to make that m- the money that we have uh, in assets, we have to make that money last for potentially another 30 to 35 years. And once you quit working, you only have one opportunity to make it work. There's a lot of decisions in retirement that are irrevocable. Like if we think of Social Security, that's an irrevocable decision. And um, so... I think about when we say one whack at the cat, you just don't get another opportunity to recreate wealth. So if you lose wealth or make a bad decision in retirement, then um, you're destined to live uh, potentially in a uh, much different state than you were when you first started retirement or when you were working. I, I really actually appreciate the way you say that and the, the way that you say that you have no opportunity to recreate wealth. We've said it here on this podcast a number of times that the standard mainstream financial advice is grow, 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 save, 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 and then ultimately to burn those assets down over a retirement timeline and end up, in many cases, with less than we started with, therefore less wealth to transfer into the next generation, we don't have a chance to recreate that wealth again. Right, and I think people need to realize that uh, it takes a different skill set um, in financial advising and also in, in clients thinking. The, the thinking that we had while we were in the accumulation phase of our life is so different and the tools and techniques and the philosophies that we have to use once we've retired and we're making that money last for 30 to 35 years, that takes a different mindset. And, and so many times consumers and or financial advisors, they, they don't have, they don't change their mindset. They keep the same mindset, but the reality is life has to be different after we retire. Cause it doesn't matter how much money we've made through, throughout our lifetime. When we retire, the only thing that matters is how much do I have left and how do I keep it? to generate the income that I need and want during my 30 to 35 years of retirement. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned something in, in your uh, kind of background introduction, you mentioned the the phrase economics based planning that you had spent your career specializing in working in economics based planning. Uh, I'd like to get your input. You know, what do you mean by that? When, when you say economics based planning, because the audience might not really understand that they may not, may have never heard that. Well, 
I mean, there's, there's, as we remember back to our college days, there's two types of economics. There's microeconomics and macroeconomics. And, um, you know, microeconomic things would say like, you know, um, let's take mortgages for an example. Somebody might say I should have a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage because I'm going to pay, um, more for a 30 year mortgage in interest. I'm going to pay in a 15 year mortgage. Well, that's a microeconomic statement. But when we look at the world macroeconomically, we have to say, which one of those was going to give me the most money? So economics-based planning uses economic theories to help people maximize the efficiency and effectiveness of their money every day of the earth. So we, we don't want people, we, we want to show people how by, by taking exactly the same money that they're currently saving, if we can use economic principles to create more wealth for them, isn't that something that everybody would want? Because most people have a difficult time saving more money. So if we can be more efficient, more effective with the money that they're saving by using economic principles, and we can create three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of additional wealth for somebody, uh, we don't. We think that's what people want. So we we strive to help people take the money that they have today that they're working very hard to get, and make it as efficient and effective as possible to maximize their income in retirement with having some kind of guarantees built in. Gotcha. Now that's a, that's an absolute great way to put it. The and that kind of goes to my my next question that that in 2014 somebody that I've interviewed on this uh, podcast twice actually Dr. Wade Fow and uh, James Cooper I believe actually they produced a research paper uh, titled uh, The Ying and Yang of Retirement Income Philosophies uh, don't worry about writing that down while you're riding your bike. Listen to this podcast. All of it will be in the show notes and links to the report and everything will be in the show notes. But this report had two fundamentally different philosophies that were compared between these two uh, experts in the fields, if you will. Can you give us kind of a background on that? Because I think it ties in with the economic based planning dis- uh, question I just asked. Yeah, it's totally related. Um, one of one of the things back to the economic space planning, Craig, too, is that you know, in in a financial world, there's no move that's a move unto its own. So every every decision that we make has a rippling effect. I kind of think of it like medicine. When I watch ads on the newspaper about medicine, it always says, "Here's side effects of this particular drug that might help you cure this, but it might do something else." That's the same thing that exists in the financial world. We have to be very careful as financial professionals that we're helping clients make decisions that don't have a positive on one side and a negative on the other side that can really hurt them. So in this paper that, that uh, you referenced, um, the, the authors talked about two philosophies, two basic fundamental philosophies as it relates to retirement income planning that exist in the country today. And I, I think I should step back and talk about retirement income planning is relatively a new field of study in financial services. Um, It didn't take much skill in the 80s and the 90s. We went through an 18-year bull market where the market had performed very, very well. And then all of a sudden, 2000 hit. And we went through the 2000, 2001, and 2002 um, uh, bear market. And then we had, obviously, we had the recession of 2008 hit us. And so what, what became more important to the American public and to financial advisors was how do I make sure that I can work with people? And so these two camps were really formed out of that. And the one, the one camp or the one philosophy that exists today is what we call probability-based. The second theory or philosophy that exists is what we call safety first. So the two, this paper referenced the probability-based planning versus the safety first planning. And I'd like to just, if I can, Greg, describe the differences. Yeah, between I was just about two. to ask you. You know, how do you how do you just how do you describe those those two f- camps, if you will? Right. So, so the, di- the the major distinction between the probability based planning and the uh, safety first planning is where the individual retiree decides to place their trust. The risk reward possibilities of an es- equity portfolio is one place that you can place your trust, or you can place it in contractual guarantees of, uh, that insurance products provide. So the safety first uh, that we're talking about is, is by combining uh, a certain insurance products with your equity or your investment products, we can give people a more secure income stream in retirement. Now, those favoring the investment side, they rely 
heavily on the on the notion that favorable returns um, over time uh, will help will outpace uh, insurance type products. Though the stock market's volatile um, over a reasonable period of time, they think it'll just perform better and they'll have more upside. But one of the things that that we don't realize in the probability based planning is that that philosophy is is certainly a, a sound strategy for the accumulation side of things. But on the distribution side of things, um, if you happen to have a, a negative return in the market early on with the probability-based strategy, you could potentially uh, hinder your ability to, to last have money last for 30 to 35 years. Right, I think And in the investment world, we call that sequence of return risk. Got, right, right. So we've talked about that before. And, and how do you describe that when you're talking to people? And, and I have to ask you this question. I have experienced this personally where I've been in rooms full of people, including financial advisors. And I've asked the room full of people, how many people know what sequence risk is? And literally no mm-hmm. hands go up, including financial advisors, CPAs in the room. Is that been an experience you've seen is just a, a real lack of, of solid understanding of what sequence risk really is? Right. I think um, what what we've been conditioned to believe and think is that average rates of return are how we should think about our investment portfolios. In fact, if we look at, you know, things that you and I are, are licensed to offer to clients as stocks and bonds and mutual funds and real estate investment trusts and I mean, there's really not any financial products, Craig, that you as a CFP and me as a CFP that we can't offer to clients. But we we often couch those things in the terms of average rates of return over one year, three year, five years, 10 years, life of the fund, life of the investment. Here's what this fund is averaged. Right. But what we know, what we know is that average rates of return are not relevant to us in how we accumulate money or how we certainly how we distribute money, because if somebody retired in January of 1990 and they, they spent the first third of their 30 year retirement in the decade of the nineties. They had one experience in their retirement in that decade. Somebody who retired in January of 2000 and lived through the decade of the two thousands where the S and P 500 returned on average 1.27%. They experienced a very different outcome for the first third of their retirement. So sequence of return risk says we don't know when we retire whether there will be a bear or a bull market. And what we know is that if we start out the, 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 our retirement with, a, with negative returns, it has a, a, a catastrophic uh, outcome on our retirement. If I could, Craig, I'd like to maybe share a personal story on this if you have time no, I for really that. appreciate that. That would be great. So in, in the late 1990s, when I had my, my own firm, um, we had a client come into us with just around a million dollars, and they were going to be retiring uh, the next year. And we did a retirement income analysis for them. And to be honest, they didn't like it. They, they thought it was too conservative, and, and it wasn't going to give them the kind of income that they wanted. And so when, when doctors give us advice or financial advisors give us advice and we don't like it, we oftentimes go someplace else to seek a second opinion. Right. And so they thought, they, they thought a second opinion from another um, investment advisory firm, and they decided to implement with that firm because they were going to give them $60,000 of income where we were not going to give them that much income. Well, so we obviously they did all that. They executed on the plan. Well, in April of 2004, my phone rings and it's my secretary, and she calls me. She said, "This couple's in the, in the conference room. They'd like to talk to you." And I walked in to talk to them, and and the wife was uh, quite distraught, and the husband was there. And I asked him what was going on, and the wife said, "Jeff, we have a really big problem, and that is that our million dollars that we had when we started our retirement." today is now worth $515,000. How many, how long was it since that you had originally visited with them again? Well, I visited with them in 1999 and they retired in, in early 2000. I think it was like March of 2000. So let's just say they had a million dollars in March of 2000. When they came in to see me in April of 2004, they had $515,000 wow. left. Wow. Now what happened to them was sequence of return risk. See, it doesn't matter what the next 30 years looks like to that couple. 
because the next 30 years could say the market had earned 8, 10, percent, whatever, 7%, whatever the return is, but it doesn't matter to that couple because the first three and a half years of their retirement, they lost almost 50% of the value of their investment portfolio. And here's what's sad to me is this couple, the wife said to me, Jeff, how could this happen? And so I went on and I showed her with the actual market performance of the last three and a half years, I plugged in their withdrawals, I plugged in their assets, and I just applied it to the S&P 500. And I said, this is what you, this is what it would look like. And guess what? It was pretty close to It's pretty close to a half a million dollars. And then she said this to me, she said, Jeff, will you, can you help us? And I said, well, there's really not much I can do because uh, you, you can't recreate wealth unless you want to go back to work. Right. So now this couple went from making $60,000 a year to making $24,000 a year within three and a half years of their retirement. And in fact, the wife was very reluctant to even leave any money at risk because she was concerned what happens if we lose more of our money. And this is what happens to people emotionally uh, with the probability based theory is they, they, um, they really don't know how to handle risk uh, when they're retired because when the money goes down, um, we all know intellectually we're supposed to buy low and sell high. That's a, that's a basic premise of investing. But emotionally, sometimes we do just the opposite. If we think back to right. 2008, when people, when the market went down 37%, people really should have been buying because that was a great buying opportunity. But what was happening in reality was uh, millions and millions and billions of dollars was being redeemed out of the investment world because people were scared about how much money they were going to lose. So that's one of the pitfalls of the probability strategy is that people can't handle risk. I, I think we, I don't like to call it risk tolerance anymore. I like to call it loss tolerance. Loss tolerance. How much yes. money are you willing to use? How much money are you willing to lose, Mr. Client, before you freak out and have to take money out? Because that's really the question. It's not about how much risk are you willing to assume. It's how much loss are you willing to take before you say, I can't take it anymore and I want to get out. Yeah, absolutely. Now, how does that then contrast to that the safety first philosophy that's that uh, that Fow and uh, Cooper uh, wrote about? Right. So, so those favoring the more more safety first mentality believe that contractual guarantees are reliable, and that the over reliance on assumptions of a favorable market return uh, can be emotionally overwhelming and dangerous to retirees. So what happens is that with the safety first uh, planning theory, we want to build in security or what I call surety to your plan. We, we don't want to, you said this early on in the call today, that you don't want to have all your money in any one type of investment or any one type of product. But what, when we think of the safety first side, uh, we're thinking of things that have contractual guarantees, like what we used to have 30 years ago with our defined benefit pension plans. That really was a type of an annuity that was was given by corporations to their employees that gave them a guaranteed income of two, three, four thousand dollars a month. Well, today with the onset of defined contribution plans, we don't have that anymore, and so we try to say to consumers on the safety first mentality or planning is let's build in some of those contractual guarantees just like you had 30 years ago, and then you can be even more aggressive with your probability-based uh, theory. But what seems to be happening in the world today is that there's an either-or camp either, as opposed to a both camp. So if you're a probability-based uh, planner or advisor, you're saying, well, we should just have all the money in the market, have it properly asset allocated, and just let it ride, and let's not worry about it. And the safety first says, well, we should take all the money out of the market and we should put it into safety product. Well, we, we think, as you mentioned early on in the, in the, in the podcast today, that we want to have a combination of all those things. It's not about asset allocation anymore. It's about product allocation. That's an interesting way to put it. What do you mean by, how, what do you mean by asset allocation versus product allocation? Well, if we think about asset allocation, it's really de de um, defined by how much stocks do I have? And even within stocks, we can have international uh, stock funds. We can have growth and income funds. We could have, um, you know, um, REITs. We can have bonds. We can have government bonds. We can have corporate bonds. We can have municipal bonds. 
uh, we can have all kinds of different asset classes. So the, the, the portfolio theory is that if I have a properly allocated portfolio, then I should be able to write out any kind of economic condition and over time I'll be fine. Well, that theory was great um, during the, the bull markets, but it hasn't served us so well in the last 15 years uh, with the volatility that we see in the market today. So the asset allocation strategy says, let's just have all these different asset classes. And what we're saying is, let's have different product allocations. So let's have some stocks, let's have some bonds, let's have some real estate, but let's also have some insurance products like annuities and, um, and life insurance in place. It's not and unlike, those, those theory. I was going to say, it's not ahead, unlike yep. a golf bag. I mean, I, I've, I've heard that uh, from you before, that, that golf bag analogy, right? Right. So you would, when I, when I play golf, I take, you know, my, my set of clubs with me and in my bag of, I have a driver, I have a three wood, I have a five wood, I have a, a two iron, a three iron, four iron, five iron, and then I have a putter and I have a, I have a wedge and it would be like what, what, um, what you can't do with either one of these is you can't say, well, I'm just going to go play my round of golf with a driver and that's it. So let's call driver a stock and let's call a putter an annuity or a bond or something. You, you would not go out and, and, and play a game of golf with just one or two clubs. And so what I think of uh, product allocation, let's think of every club as a different type of a product. And some of those products are going to have safety first built into them, and some of them are going to have probability based into them. We're not saying that people can go and put all their money in safety and give up some of the upside that we'll need for inflation adjustments and those kinds of things. But we also say that people shouldn't just be all in the probability and have no safety because they have no safety net underneath them. Now, if I could get your, I want to get your insight on this and just uh, get your feedback on this. I've heard uh, from investment professionals who are very much on the probability side of things that, oh, well, we're going to fill the golf bag with, uh, let's just say, a mutual fund, real estate, bonds, real estate investment trusts. We're going to fill it with ETFs. Uh, we're going to fill it with variable annuities. And there you go. See, we've done that. We have, we have an allocation model. And mm-hmm. what, what I've heard as I've, as I've gone through this is, well, that's just an entire bag full of things that are based on probabilities and risk, right? I mean, that doesn't... That well, doesn't that's correct. So if you think... We didn't, we didn't think years ago, Craig, that my second quote that, that I have that I use a lot is, if you were going to find out something wasn't true, when would you want to know? Would you want to know right now or would you want to know down the road? Right now. So the reality is, if we were going to find out something wasn't correct, when would we want to know? The answer should always be, well, right now, so that I can make my right decisions, so that I don't find out down the road that what I thought to be true wasn't true. So one of the things that we've learned over time is that uh, we never thought that... that um, the stock market and the bond market could be as low as they've been and interest rates could be as low as they've been over the last 15 years. As you know, Morningstar did some research in 2013 with Dave Blanchard, who's the head of retirement research at Morningstar, and Dr. Michael Fink, who's the economics professor at Texas Tech, and then Dr. Wade Fow, who's a retirement income uh, professor at the American College. Those three gentlemen did a research paper for Morningstar, and what they said was that uh, we have to worry more about sequence risk than we've ever had to worry about because of the, the low bond yields that are out there today and low interest rates that are out there today because older people tend to invest more heavily in bonds than they do stocks. There's a theory out there that exists called the age asset rule, which says if you take your age of 100 minus your, if you take 100 minus your current age, that's how much money uh, you should have in, in, um, in stock. So if you're 30 years old, you'd have um, 30% of your money in, I'm sorry, in bonds. I said it wrong. How much money you'd have in bonds. If you're 30 years old, you have 70% of your money in bonds and 70% of your money in stocks. Just the opposite. If you're 70, 70 years. Right. It, it was just the opposite of what you just said there. So a 30 year old yeah, would I, have 70% stock and they would have 30% in bonds. That's correct. Okay. And a 70 year old would have 70% in bonds and 30% in stocks. That's kind of what we call the age asset rule. It's, it's, it's a very simplistic theory, but it still exists out there today. Oh, I've heard and it so what times. you think about with retirees, they invest more heavily in bonds. The whole purpose of the 
of the Morningstar research that, that Dave Blanchett, Michael Fink, and uh, Wade Fow did was to say, we have to worry about sequence of return risk more than we've ever had to worry about it. And that's changing the landscape of how people uh, have to plan for their retirements. That was the premise of that research report. Absolutely. The And I've heard that uh, multiple times. And I have to tell you, just uh, as from a practice you know, point of view, working with people today, that when I run, as an example for a prospective client, I will often share with them what their probability income model would look like from a typical financial advisor who specializes in accumulation and the probability uh, school of thought. And the Monte Carlo simulation, that seat, that uh, probability model does not work very well with the age asset rule anymore, that in order to actually get more favorable looking income uh, recommendations from a Monte Carlo simulation nowadays, you have to be more heavily weighted on the stocks than on the actual bond portfolio. It's very interesting how that has changed over the years that today a, a, a higher bond portfolio percentage actually reduces the amount of income that a Monte Carlo simulation might suggest. Right, we've seen that with the with the advent of what what used to be called the four percent rule, uh, where where theory, theory was that you could withdraw four percent off your portfolio and have a high probability of making it last. I, I would like to speak, Craig, just a little bit to the probability thing that you just mentioned about Monte Carlo. There's something that the audience needs to understand about a Monte Carlo simulation, and that is that. Um, when you start with a million dollars in your retirement portfolio and you do a Monte Carlo simulation, they, they come back with a, with a percentage probability of 70, 80, 90%. By definition of a Monte Carlo simulation to be successful, the definition means that you have a positive portfolio. So here's what the, the audience needs to understand is you may have started with a million dollars. And 30 years down the road, for you to have an 80% probability could mean that you only have $1 left. Well, <laughs> theoretically, that, th- theoretically, that makes sense. But in practice, the American consumer will not do that because when people see their million dollars go to 700, they see it go to 500, they see it go to 300, I don't think they keep spending the same money that they were spending because they know they don't want to run out of money. So the, the, the Monte Carlo is assuming that you spend the same amount of money Every year in retirement, with an inflation hedge built in of two and a half or three percent, whatever you put in the Monte Carlo. But the reality is, when in, in practice, in people's behavior, so behavior economics says that people won't continue to spend the same money in retirement if their assets go down. Even though they might be able to take that amount of money, they won't take it because they're fearful of running out of money. For sure, and and that's very important. That's a very important point that that the traditional, that typical contemporary nowadays financial conversation with uh, a financial advisor as it relates to how much income can we have is generally going to be a Monte Carlo-based conversation uh, using the Monte Carlo probability simulator. And success equals $1 left. And I'll have to say, Jeff, right. I've actually experienced that multiple times where I've met with people after, much like your example, after they have begun a an income plan based on a Monte Carlo recommendation, and then the market crashed in 2008. And I asked them, how much are they drawing now? Because they started drawing at four or five percent. And I asked uh, this gentleman uh, not long ago, how much are you drawing now? And he just said with kind of a quiet voice, we're only drawing 2% now. I mean, so that's what they did. They, They cut their draw in more than in half. I mean, that means their lifestyle has been cut substantially. It's a, it's, it's a, it's amazing. Or they have to save more money. As you know from the Morningstar research, if you go from a 4% withdrawal rate, which means if I have a million dollars, I'm taking $40,000 a year off, the the Morningstar article says you can really only take 2.8%. Well, the difference of that 1.2% 
requires the client to save an extra 42.9% of their money. So said another way, instead of having a million dollars to generate the same income of 40 at 2.8%, you have to have a million, almost a million and a half dollars to generate the same income. Yeah, that's, and that's pretty not, significant for the American public to, to come to grips with. Oh, and, and especially considering that we're not saving enough as it is, and, oh, all you have to do is actually save an extra half a million dollars. Right. right to to right. end up with an income that you might not outlive, right? Right. So, this outstanding points. I think you mentioned something in there that, that behavior economics— Behavioral mm-hmm. economics is is something that we don't generally hear, and I actually spoke of this um, in in one of my podcast episodes uh, not long ago, where it was related to certain recommendations from financial entertainers that suggest investing in one way and insuring themselves in another, and the reason that it doesn't work is that behaviorally most people don't actually invest in the recommended way for that particular strategy. So I guess what you're saying is that behavioral economics really just permeates all of these different things from the accumulation through the income phase of our retirement. Right. I mean, I, I, as I said earlier in in the podcast today, I've been in the business 31 years and it wasn't until recently within the last 10 years or so that we even began to think about or talk about behavioral economics. And what, what we know, as I said earlier in the, in the podcast, people intellectually know that you're supposed to buy when, when values are low and you're supposed to sell when values are high. That's what we all know intellectually. But Dalbar does a study, and J.P. Morgan put this out on, on, be, on investor behavior, and it shows from 1990 to 2009, during that 20-year period, which was 10 years of the 90s, which the market was performing very well, and then 10 years of the market during the 2000s when it wasn't performing as well, but still during that 20-year period of time, the S&P 500 returned on average 8.2%. But this is the interesting point, Craig, that I, want to, I want everybody to get, is that the average investor only earned 2.3% during that 20 years. Well, somebody who doesn't understand would say, well, how can the market earn 8.2% and I only got 2.3%? And it comes back to what I said earlier about 2008. One of the things that we know that happened in 2008 was there was massive redemptions from the mutual fund world in 2008. In fact, the mutual fund families didn't have enough cash to pay for all the redemptions that were coming in. So behaviorally, see, we knew that that the market was down 37%, and we, we knew intellectually we should have been putting money in the market. But the reality was our behavior said we better get out because we don't know where the bottom is going to be. Right. This is the behavior This is the behavior that, that clients have, that we have, that we need to guard ourselves against. And the, and the way we guard ourselves against that is to have a, product, a properly product-allocated life as opposed to a, an asset-allocated life where all of our money – could go down at the same time. We need to have surety in our retirement plan that no matter what happens, a basic level of income is there and guaranteed for me. And that's a key. The basics, covering your your cost of housing, groceries, lifestyle, food, insurance, the basic things that you need to survive to make sure that those are just simply guaranteed that you don't have to worry about outside forces coming in and, and affecting you. That's, that's going to really help you with your behavioral economics, right? Right. And I think, you know, one of the things that we talked about, um, Craig, that I think is, is good to go on and talk about is what risk do people really assume in retirement? Well, I'd like to talk about it, two or three of those if I could. Do we have I'd time really, to go through yeah, those? No, absolutely. I was going to ask you that. I appreciate it. So Harvard uh, did, a, did a paper in, in June of 2014 that I know you, have, you could put in the hands of, of people that are listening to this call, but it's called Crisis and Retirement Planning. And one of the things that they talked about in this research was that the, that the American retiree is going to face today is having to manage their money in retirement. Well, what caused that to happen was the shift away from a defined benefit pension plan that we had 30 years ago. If we think about 30 years ago when people retired, they had a defined benefit plan that gave them a guaranteed income stream in retirement for as long as they lived. 
Right. And they gave, they had social security, which gave them a guaranteed income from as long as they live. And then they had their personal savings. Well, with the onset of defined contribution plans, that risk has been transferred from the employer and the pension benefit guarantee corporation to the consumer. And now the consumer has to manage their money. That's a risk that they have to handle today in their own lives that 30 years ago, they didn't have to handle. And unfortunately, People don't understand that today because they're not thinking about it in the accumulation phase. And by the time they get to the retirement phase, if they don't structure their product allocation properly, they're going to be uh, potentially in a, in a uh, less than favorable situation. Well, now, just to be fair for the audience out there, I've... I... My, my opinion on this is that it's not generally the fault of the, the consumer and the general public. It's, it's, the, it's the message that is out there as it relates to the education provided for retirement planning, that, that the financial world as, as a whole does not have a financial incentive to teach people how to take their money out of the system. So there's ve- Correct. so hence you know again my opinion there's very little education that has been provided over the last 20 30 years to teach people how to properly set themselves up to take their income and to take their distributions. That's correct. Yeah and then and, and another risk another risk Craig that that's probably worth talking about that people face today that they didn't have to face with a defined benefit plan, and that's what we call longevity risk. Oh, absolutely. Like, that would be also mortality risk, right? Right, exactly. So Wharton uh, did a paper back in 2007 called Lump Sum Investing in Retirement. And one of the things that they talked about, and and Dr. Thaw's done research on this as well, is uh, how do we handle longevity risk? Even if we can handle market risk by, by... by properly allocating our, our portfolio, we still don't have a, a guarantee that we're not going to have um, run out of money in a 30 or 35 year period. So what Wharton talked about in this research was how do I fix the longevity risk problem? See, most things that we plan in life, we know where the beginning is and we know where the end is. I, I drove back to Iowa where I grew up over Thanksgiving and you know, we knew that there was a 12-hour drive ahead of us, and we knew where the beginning was, and we knew where the end was. When I decide to, to retire from, from my current work and live on my money, I don't know where the end of my life is. It might be at 70, it might be at 80, it might be at 90. I have a father-in-law that's 88, and I have an a, a aunt that's 97. We, they, don't, they didn't know when they retired where they were going to be at this time in their life. Right. So the problem, the problem with longevity risk is we just don't know when we're going to uh, not need our income anymore. So what Wharton talked about in this, in this article was using, uh, again, in a product allocation thought process or theory is using income annuities to help offset the longevity risk. If you think about a defined benefit plan 30 years ago, it was basically an annuity product. It, it, it gave people a guaranteed income for the rest of their life. And yes, some people um, unfortunately died early and some people live long. And that's one of the things that you get with an annuity that you can't get anywhere else because the risk pooling mechanism that's actually figured into that. Now, that's so one of the things actually, that the academic... Jeff, if I can jump in there, that's something that's really important, I think, for people to, to focus on is that the reason that pensions and these annuity products are able to pay out these more secure, consistent, and higher income levels than the probability-only model is that the, the pensions and the insurance companies have been able to pool together that risk and spread that risk so you are not alone in the swimming pool. Correct. That's and and so important. if you could replicate what everybody loved about their pension plan 30 years ago, was um, it, it gave them guaranteed income. And yet people today, as you and I talk to consumers all over the country, one of the things that we know is they have, sometimes they have a displeasing thought towards annuities because there are some people in the world today, in the financial world, that don't like annuities, and they publicize the fact that annuities are bad. Well, the problem is that, that they're, the consumer doesn't know how to discern 
uh, one annuity from another annuity. And so they think all annuities are bad. The kind of annuity that we're talking about that replicates the defined benefit plan and that deals with the longevity risk is a thing called a single premium immediate annuity. And again, Dr. Fowles written about this, Wharton's written about this, uh, Dr. Michael Fink's written about this. So we need to get this information out to the consumers that the kind of annuity that we're talking about in this product allocated world is one that will give you a guaranteed income stream for the rest of your life. So we've solved really the longevity risk problem we've solved by um, buying the income annuity. Gotcha. And, and absolutely. the That is, again, the key. If we take away the longevity risk, and I've told the audience this before, that the reason that my mom didn't call me in the midst of the Great Recession of 2008, 9, 10, and so forth, the reason that she did not call me worried and concerned is that her primary income comes from guaranteed annuity income products from insurance companies that pay her a consistent guaranteed paycheck and, of course, guaranteed by the insurance company, and there's a whole disclosure that can go with that. But my mom doesn't have any financial concerns because all of her primary lifestyle needs are covered. And, and that's, mm-hmm. that's huge security, and it makes her feel good knowing that she can go out on vacation and she never has to worry about a recession or depression, a stock market crash, or Greece blowing up the economy. Right. And I think it's important, Craig, I know to say this at this time, we're not, we're not saying to the audience that, that they should take all the money they have and put it in an income annuity. That's not what we're suggesting. What we're suggesting is building a floor of, uh, of guarantees. So if I could just describe that for a second, yes. um, in, in the Wharton research, they, they suggested that they, that a, a, a substantial amount of annuitization was, was um, supported by a sophisticated model of economic decision-making. What that means is that let's say that a person in retirement is going to make $100,000 a year. That's how much income they want to have in retirement. But they determined that 50000 of that 100000 is absolutely the basic level of living expenses that they should that they need to have no matter what happens. They have to have the other 50 is, is discretionary, but the first 50 is what they need to have to live, to pay their taxes, to pay their property taxes, and so on. So what what Wharton suggests, which is what we subscribe to as well, is that you should take your your basic level of expenses, and let's say you're going to get twenty five thousand dollars a year from Social Security. You would get you would take the twenty five thousand from Social Security plus the twenty five thousand you would get from the income annuity, and that would provide your fifty thousand dollars a year of basic level of income. The other fifty thousand dollars that you have coming in, that would be in a Monte Carlo philosophy. So it's important for for us to have the consumer re- realize that we're not suggesting all of one or all of the other. We're actually su- suggesting a combination of of um, the safety first and the probability based. Absolutely. Now it's right. It's what we said in the beginning. It's it's something that permeates every conversation that I have, and that I know this is the case with you, Jeff. That that what I said in the beginning is that optimizing retirement income does not happen with a single product. And remember that anything that might be investment related, whether it's mutual funds or real estate, that is a product. And optimizing right. retirement income doesn't happen with life insurance. It doesn't happen with mutual funds. It doesn't happen with any one thing. It has to be a balanced right. approach. Correct. The longevity risk, though, I mean, you heard Jeff say it, uh, that, you know, what is uh, grandma's, what, uh, 97? Well, how old, 93? No, my aunt's 97, my father-in-law is 88, and my mom's 80, 82. I mean, it, <laughs> Everybody in the audience right now, if I asked you to raise your hand, does anybody know anybody who's uh, lived to be 90 plus years old? I mean, there's hands going up all over the country that it's completely different world that did not exist 30 years ago. You didn't know as many people living to be 100, uh, you know, living to be 95 years old. That longevity risk is huge. And that combined with sequence of returns risk is I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, I won't say a deadly combination, but it's a financially tremendously risky combination when you do not have a plan to deal with longevity risk and sequence risk uh, in that retirement years. 
Well, what it does, Craig, is it puts so much pressure on your money that it's, it's excruciatingly uh, stressful uh, because you have to make everything that you have last. And if you take and, and have some of the safety first mentality, it takes the, the longevity risk away and the sequence of return risk, it certainly minimizes that. Th- there's one point that I failed to make earlier that I want to make on the sequence of return risk, and that is that over a 30-year period of time, the market could perform quite generously. But if negative returns are experienced early in the stages of one's uh, retirement, the sequence of return manifests itself through the fact that these returns early on will cause the portfolio to uh, probability to go down. If I could just share a story, T. Rowe Price did a did a uh, a study of a client that had an uh, an eighty percent probability Monte Carlo in in January of two thousand, and in in two thousand and ten, after with a fifty five percent forty five fifty five percent stock forty five percent bond portfolio, they went from an 80% probability to a 29% probability over a, over 10 years. So one third of their retirement, their probability went from 80% to 29%. And let's just be clear now, that's for the pretty audience. Significant. Yeah, let's be clear for the audience. In a Monte Carlo simulation, an 80% probability means an 80% probability of success meaning that Correct. that a husband or wife will not die broke, they will have at least $1. So you're saying that they went from an 80% number at the beginning of their retirement and, yes. and 10 years in... To a 29% um, in, in 10 years. And this, this um, number I'm sharing with you is in, in a Wall Street Journal article in 2013 called Say Goodbye to the 4% Rule, it's actually referenced in that article that talks about the uh, T. Rowe Price study. Wow. Listen, for everybody listening, the, Jeff, this has been just an outstanding interview, and Jeff has dropped so much fantastic information and references. We're going to actually have all of these things available. If you would like to get a copy or a link to any of this information, it's going to be in the show notes. If you want any uh, references directly to PDFs or copies of these articles from the Wall Street Journal or Dr. Fow or uh, Michael Fink, uh, just send me an email and, and I'll be able to just send you a, a PDF copy of that. It's going to be a lot easier than trying to link up with all of these various pieces. Just send me an email. I'm happy to send you the information directly. Uh, Jeff, any closing thoughts that you might have as we wrap up here? Because this has just been outstanding. So much fantastic information. Well, just I guess in closing, um, there's little in the way of broad agreement in the financial uh planning and advising world today on which approach is best for retirement income planning. You know, as we talk, some favor the investment world while other favor the more secure insurance types of products. But what we've tried to accomplish today with this call is we've, spo- we've explored the idea that it takes a more integrated approach, uh, which includes insurance products, investment products, and, and even life insurance products to help people enhance their retirement. So I would say to the audience this, if using proper planning, using economics-based theory, as you know, Craig, with, with this planning approach, we're able to show people how they can get 30 to 50% more income in retirement by using this integrated approach. And at the same time, we're able to show them how they can have somewhere between maybe 50 to 75% of that as a potential guarantee coming into them for the rest of their life. So it's really worth the consumer to look at what we've talked about today because we can show them potentially how to have more money and then also have a large percentage of that or certainly a bigger percentage of that that's guaranteed. So I think the the industry today is in in flux in a way on which theory is best. And what we're saying is it's not the probability based or the safety first, it's a combination of those together that will give the clients the their best income opportunity in retirement with the best amount of guarantees. That's what we want them to walk away from this call today. Yeah, it's not a one or the other type of a situation where one camp versus the other. That's a great way to conclude today is that it takes an actual strategy, an actual plan, combining things together in the proper ratios and the right balance to maximize that income. So 
get over to personalpensionradio.com, check out the show notes, look for, if you want to look for previous episodes with Dr. Fow, check out episode 21 and 24. Those are excellent in interviews. And again, I'm going to have all of this information available for you. Just send me an email. And more importantly, if you'd like to see what your retirement income numbers could look like, and you'd like to know what they look like on your current path, as opposed to uh, combining these strategies together, I'm happy to do that for you. Do a free retirement income analysis for you so you can see what you're headed for. Uh, just get in touch with me at Personal Pension Radio. Jeff, really appreciate you being here. And I think uh, today is the first day of vacation for you, right? It is. Well, it good. Is. Get out and have fun with the new grandbaby, right? Yeah, all right. Thank you so much, Craig. I appreciate being with you. Hey, you're very welcome. I appreciate it. Uh, Everybody listening, we'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you for listening to the Personal Pension Radio Podcast. If you missed anything during the show, that's okay. We took the notes for you. Check the show notes for links, offers, and a full transcript. And don't forget to head over to personalpensionradio.com and download your free retirement income report. While you're there, we'd appreciate some iTunes love. Please leave us a fantastic rating on iTunes by going to personalpensionradio.com slash iTunes. Thanks again for listening.